Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we, we thank you for the wonderful things that you do for us, Lord. I thank you for this group of dedicated believers that come out here to hear more about your words. Very special book, the book of Revelation, oh Lord. And Father, we just ask you to let your presence be felt in a mighty and powerful way. It's a very, very difficult book for most of us to understand. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help me to get out of your way and that you explain it through me as we go, Lord. And I pray, Father, that as we undergo this study, that as we go through this little journey that we're going through, Lord, that not only will we have a better understanding of what this book means, but we'll know how it applies to our lives in the day and age we live in. We ask all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm back. Okay, I want to welcome you guys, especially you guys that are joining us that don't usually come on. You guys that don't usually come on Wednesday nights. Uh, this is the way we do Wednesday nights at Grace Baptist Church. We are uh, we relaxed, we're informal, uh, and we do that on purpose. We we want to create a, an environment where we can learn and and really absorb this, and we don't want to have time for fellowship, so I pray that, that you'll come a little early next time if you didn't get here for something to eat, and that uh, you'll get to know some of the folks if you don't know them already, and so it's a good time in the Lord, and obviously we're going to study this really fascinating book here, the book of Revelation. Uh, now, I have said uh, on more than one occasion that my two favorite books in the Bible are James and the book of Revelation. I will go ahead and confess to you, uh, it took me nine years before I ever felt comfortable enough to teach out of the book of Revelation. And uh, I've been a pastor for 17, so it, you know, it, it takes a while for everybody to really and truly grasp this book. Uh, I'm a little curious, how many of you guys have ever been through a study of the book of Revelation? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you guys completed the study? A lot, oftentimes, you know, people kind of don't, don't make it through the whole study. Uh, well, one of the reasons that, you know, Revelation is so special because in many churches, uh, as a matter of fact, as a general rule, I would say it's the most avoided book in the Bible. And it's avoided, number one, because it's difficult, very difficult to understand. That's one of the primary reasons it's avoided. But the other reason is it's about the end times. And generally speaking, people don't like to talk about the end times. But, you know, you know, the plus side is it's a very fascinating book. And as you begin to study the Bible and you see how harmonious the, the Word of God truly is, when you see how something that was written uh, five or six hundred years earlier, the book of Daniel, works so perfectly with the book of Revelation and uh, First Thessalonians and the Olivet Discourse, how it all works together so perfectly, it just basically, it increases your faith. It's, it reminds you that, you know, that God is in control and it's going to work out exactly like he says it's going to play out. Okay, now, one of the things that uh, I want to point out is, you know, this is a book that has several different interpretations. And that's very important that you remember that. For example, there are those that think that the church is going to go through the tribulation period. In other words, there are some that believe in the post-tribulation, which means that we will actually be part of, you know, this, when God pours his, sin, uh, his wrath out on sinful humanity. Okay, we don't believe that. We believe in pre-trib, which means we as believers will be raptured before the tribulation takes place. Basically, the way the timetable plays out is we're going to be raptured. Jesus is going to come back for his church. And very soon after that will be the beginning of the tribulation period. Now, also, we need to understand there's some that believe uh, that you can, we're going to be, uh, church is going to be raptured in the middle of the tribulation period. Now, the point is, the bottom line is, it is okay for believers, Christians to disagree. That's not the only thing that Christians of different denominations and so on disagree on. You know, we, we have disagreements as believers on eternal security, once saved, always saved, that sort of thing. We have differences in our spiritual gifts. It is okay to disagree on those type of interpretations. 
But I will say it is not okay to disagree in here. And the reason is, you know, we believe in a futurist literal interpretation of the Bible. And that's what you're going you're gonna to receive as we go forward. That's what I'm going to teach, okay? So this is not a place to dispute, you know, whether the church will be uh, raptured before or after. That's not what this study is for, okay? Now, it's rooted in Old Testament imagery. A uh, good understanding of the uh, Old Testament is very helpful. As a matter of fact, there's 300 references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. Now, this is also important. It's a book of visions. Now, I didn't say one vision. I said it's a book of visions, okay? John uh, is exiled on the island of Patmos, as we're getting ready to see, and he has his first vision in chapter 1. But he has a series of visions as we go forward. Now, as he has these visions, we need to understand where these visions are taking place. Some of these visions are going to be taking place on basically what is happening on earth. Some of these visions are going to be taking place as basically talking about what's happening in heaven. So it's important as we go forward to know where, where this particular scene is occurring at. Now... It's not all in chronological order. Uh, most of it is, but there are times, for example, between the sixth and seventh seal that they break off in chapter seven, and and John tells you what he sees, which he sees the 144,000 spirit-filled Jews. Okay, you know, and, and so he tells us about that, and then he tells us about the the tribulation saints, you know, for the first time. So we call those parentheses. It's kind of like if you're watching a movie. And you've got this chronological order of the movies going forward, and then it breaks away and it, it, it shows you a memory or something that someone's having. It's kind of like that. It's there to paint the background of something that's going on at the same time. But anyway, please don't get ahead. We will open it up to discussion from time to time. I ask you not to get ahead because there's so much to cover. You won't get all the answers tonight. Uh, we're going to try to focus on chapter 1. If we get too far ahead, we might confuse some of the people that are here. Uh, it might confuse me, as a matter of fact, and, and you know, and uh, might frustrate others. So be mindful that also that we're going to be recorded tonight. Now, I, I, Sam is going to, it's going to be an audio recording. It's not going to be a video. Obviously, you don't see any cameras. But sometime, uh, I guess, in the next day or so, it would be placed on our website. And YouTube, okay. So it'll, it will be on our YouTube uh, channel, and it'll also be on gracebabschurch.wilson.com, uh, okay. It'll pro probably be very easy to see where it is. Now, on a personal note, maybe you can relate to this. When I was younger, this book scared me to death. As a matter of fact, when I was not practicing my faith, you know, I did not want to talk about the book of Revelation. Because that was just gloom and doom and something that just depressed me. It was something I didn't want to think about. But the truth of the matter is, if you're a true believer, you shouldn't be scared. This book is not written to scare us as believers. It's written to encourage us. Now keep in mind, the original readers were these seven churches that we see in chapter 2 and 3. They were the first ones to read this book. Now they were under tremendous persecution at that time. They needed some encouragement. So basically, Randolph, I know I can't take you anywhere. Okay. All right. They were under tremendous persecution. So this letter was written basically to tell them, hang in there, Jesus wins. That's, in a nutshell, what it was written for. Hang in there. Things look bad. I know it's tough, but hang in there. We know how this plays out and Jesus wins. However, I will say for the unbeliever or for the person who is not where they need to be and they know it, then you need to be very concerned. I'm not going to lie to you. And as you go forward, I don't think it's going to take a brain surgeon to realize that. If you're not where you need to be, you need to be very concerned if you're not a believer because, you know, this is serious business. Now, the answer is it's not to ignore this book is to do something about it. That's the only answer when you think about it. It's not to ignore it because you don't like what you're hearing. You know, the answer is to do something about it. That's always the answer, okay? Now, some people choose to ignore it, but the truth of the matter is, 
the truth of God's word is there whether we're going to read it or not. We would be much better off reading it, okay? And that's what we're going to do. Now, here's a couple of questions I have. You know, what evidence do you see that the time is drawing near? What evidence do you see in the times we live in that the time is drawing near? What speaks to you in that regard? Falling away of the church. Falling away of the church. I would definitely agree with that. More so every day. The church, generally speaking, the church of Jesus Christ is in decline. It's in major decline. More so than at any time in my lifetime. Uh, the churches are closing at a rapid rate. And, you know, and that's part of the end times. There's something called the great apostasy. And part of the end times is that, you know, Christ, you know people are going to turn their backs on their faith. Okay? So Christianity is going to be even more a minority than it was. So that's part of it. Yeah, that's a true sign. What else do you see? Children turning against their parents and children against their children. Yep, and that's, you know, if you look at, uh, uh, I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, you know, in the last days people will be scoffers, lovers of money, lovers of self. I think it says something about disrespecting their parents. Uh, yeah, that's another thing uh, to point out. Yeah. Uh, anybody got anything else to add? Wars, 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 and wars. wars and rumors of wars. Okay. Now, if you look, the when we get to chapter six, uh, I think it's uh, I think it's the second horse is a the red horse, the horse of war. Now that coincides with you know what Jesus says on the Olivet Discourse when the disciples ask him how his kingdom will be brought in. Basically, they're asking him. You know, how will the curtain come down? And he says, there will be wars and rumors of wars, but not to get concerned, that's just the beginning of birth pains. Okay? So how that plays out is when the tribulation really begins, there will be wars, you know, playing out, but that's just the beginning. You know, that's not, you know, when you get to the middle part of the tribulation period, it just progressively gets really, really worse. So, yeah, that's a, that's a real sign Right now, there are wars and rumors of wars. That should be a concern. What about the plagues that you've seen? Uh, has anybody ever in our lifetime, we've never seen, most of us have not seen anything like COVID. Well, no matter how it played out, that's irrelevant. The fact is, you know, most of the world shut down because of COVID. And, you know, it was a real eye-opener that, you know, what is another thing that's going to be part of the end times? There was going to be famine and there's going to be plagues. Okay, I believe that's the pale horse that rides out. Okay, or uh, anyway, we'll get to that. So, anybody got anything else? That's another good one because in all the discourse, Jesus says the love of most will grow cold. Okay, we're seeing that like never before. Okay. It's all working towards a, a one world religion, so to speak, and it feeds into the great apostasy, turned away from the faith. And how about watering down the faith? You know, how about churches that do exist? They're pretty much, you know, a lot of a lot of them are watering down their faith and, you know, to conform to the culture as, a, as opposed to the culture conforming to God's word, right? And that's, we're seeing that increasingly, right? All right. Well, when you hear the word apocalypse, what do you think? think. Zombies. Zombies.
I mean, like in Charlotte, I read something, and this was probably a couple years ago, about a school having a demonic club. And I'm just like, what on earth? You know, they're not even trying to cover it up anymore. It's openly practiced and openly, you know, exposing children. And mm-hmm. It's just everywhere. That's right. And you say, like you say anything about Jesus, you're doing wrong. Yep. There's, no, there's no value in life. 13-year-olds walking up and shooting people with no no yeah, there's a no school shooting today. No, yeah. yeah. There's no value of life. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, it's it's pretty. It, it looks pretty bleak out there, doesn't it? I mean, there's plenty of reasons to think that the time is near. Now, apocalypse basically that's the Greek word for it's a disclosing what is hidden. Uh, it's the Greek word for revelation, something that's being revealed, something that is being manifested, and that's what we're talking about here today. Now. If you pick up your scripture, we'll go ahead and start Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. We made it known, he made it known by sending his angels to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now first of all, this book is about Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus, it's about his return, and it's about all the events that lead up to his return, second coming. Now, the main subject, you know, being Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, beginning of the end, uh, you know, and then he says, will soon take place. Now, remember, that's kind of confusing. It said, will soon take place. This book was written 2,000 years ago, so why has it happened? Well, we've got to understand that he's not necessarily saying it will soon take place like next week. But he is saying that when it does, it will move quickly. Now, if you follow the book of Revelation, when things start going, they start increasing in speed and and intensity. So it's it's going to really it's going to really unfold. Now, you know, going off on on a on a a side road, I mean, when you consider just the four horsemen, the wars and rumors of wars, the four horsemen that ride out in the first four judgments, the seal judgments are opened up. You got the Antichrist, he's the first one. You got the you got the horse of war, the wars that are started, you got the plagues, you got the famine, you know, you got all that. It's easy to see how a lot of that can play out because a lot of the crops I can see where, you know, uh, the world could be in a, a a bad situation really, really soon. You can see where obviously where wars could start overnight. You see it, uh, that playing out and it keeps us up at night. So you can see that you know, the proverbial fat lady is at the microphone clearing her throat. You know, anybody can see that, right? So that's the way we live in the times we live in. So in God's eyes, basically he's saying it's imminent. It's going to happen. It's, you know, it's just a matter of time. And when it happens, it's going to move fast. Now, so who is this angel that he's talking about? Now, this angel, most believe, we don't know, but most believe it's Gabriel. Now, keep in mind, you know, Gabriel had a very special message that he delivered to Daniel. Gabriel had a very special message that he delivered to Zechariah. And then, of course, he had a very special message that he delivered to Mary. So he's God's very special messenger angel, and he's one that always sends the sent when it's got some big news. So it makes sense that it would be, but we cannot be sure. Now, here's something important in verse 3. It says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Now, blessed are those that read. In other words, take it seriously. That's what you're here for. You know, you're obviously taking it seriously. You're taking it to heart. That's what we're talking about. You know, remember I told you, you know, you can ignore the book because it's difficult or it's scary, but at the end of the day, the best approach is learn what it says and see how you, you know, what changes you might need to make to, to, to feel good about it, okay? Be in line. But he says you have a blessing. Now, time is near. Now, let me pull off here and say there's no prophetic event that has to happen before the rapture of the church. Now, keep in mind, you know, we believe that the church is going to be raptured, uh, and there's an abundance of Scripture to back up that belief. But, you know, there's nothing that has to happen before God come, Jesus comes back and, and comes for his church in the rapture. So the time is near. You know, it could take place at any time, you know, and we need to be ready. Now, why would God wait so long? 
Well, if you look at 2 Peter 3, 8, it says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, there's two things we need to understand. God and time means something different to God than it does to us, something entirely different, okay? So we can't hold God to a specific concept of time. And the second thing is, you know, he is trying to get as many people in heaven as possible. He wants, he wants his word to go out, and he wants, you know, as many souls to be saved as possible, and guess who he's left with the task to do, make that happen? The church, us, okay? Now, that's why that's so important. Now, if you look at John in chapter 4, John says, To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits from his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Now, these are seven existing churches at that time. There were real churches. Now, they were part of a postal route. Now, John is on the island of Patmos, so he did get released, okay? He did get released at one time, tradition says. And, you know, so he was released, and the first thing he would go... In, in the order that you see these churches, he, you know, as they're going to be listed, he would go to the church at Ephesus. They were all lined up. Now, this was an open letter, meaning the entire book was meant to be an open letter. So he later in chapter 2 and 3, he writes specifically to each of these churches, but each church was to read what was wrong with the other church or what was right with the other church. They all read the entire book, okay? It was an open letter. Now... You know, he says, who is, was, and is to come. Obviously, that's God the Father. Then he says the seven spirits. Well, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In reference over there in Isaiah chapter 11. Look at these characteristics of the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, Basically, and then we see Jesus Christ, so we see the Trinity represented once again. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, if you look at verse 7, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the people of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, when he says he's coming on a cloud, he's talking about the second coming. He's not talking about the rapture. Now, you know, basically for believers that believe in the rapture, there will be two comings. There will be the coming for his church in the rapture, and then we will come back as his church in the second coming. We'll be coming back with him, okay? Now, he's talking about the second coming. The first coming, the rapture, when he has the rapture, only believers will be able to see that. But when he comes back the second time, the entire world will see that, even the ones that pierced him. Talking about the Jews, he's going, they're going to see it, and they're going to be very upset when they see the Messiah that they miss coming back. Of course, now God's got a plan for the, the uh, nation of Israel. The nation of Israel finally will be saved, but we'll get into that later on. But anyway, uh, it's basically going to be the most incredible event in human history. You know, it's going to be something that's going to boggle the mind. And he says Alpha and Omega, we're talking about the Greek alphabet, most of you know that. And Jesus, basically he started it, he finished it, and he's going to settle all the accounts. That's what I get from that. Now, what does Alpha and Omega mean to our daily lives? When you hear, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, what do you think of? What, what, should, that, what should that say to you? Eternal. Eternal, okay. Good answer. He's everything. Should he be your everything? You know, should he be your everything? You know, should he be first? Is he obviously in control? Okay, so it speaks volumes to our daily life, right? 
Now, you know, it takes us a while to get there. That's called maturing in your faith. But that's where we're ultimately trying to get as believers, right? All right. Now we'll get cranked up a little bit. It says in verse 9, it says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance, that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, that's the order that you would leave. That's the order those churches are in, you know, and it'd be a postal route. Now, John, let's take a minute and talk about him. John's the apostle. He was, you know, the last living apostle at this time. He's an old man. It's somewhere around A.D. 95. And you may remember when uh, Peter, after he denied the Lord, three times when Jesus was resurrected and he restored him, uh, you know, he asked about John. Say, what, what about, what happens to John? And Jesus says, if I want him to live forever, what's that to you? Well, John doesn't live forever, but he's the only one that died a natural death. Tradition says he died after he returned to Ephesus, after he was released from Patmos at the ripe old age of 102 years old, okay? Now, the other apostles, disciples, they had been martyred long ago. As a matter of fact, the very first martyr was John's brother. We see that in the Bible. That was James. He was the first martyr. That was John's brother. And you know that Peter was martyred. Tradition says that Peter didn't feel like he was worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus, so he asked that he would be, you know, crucified upside down, and he was granted his request, okay? They were all martyred, but John, he has been exiled at this particular place to the Greek island of Patmos, which is basically a rocky island where they did hard labor and they were sent, you know, for in his case, just for preaching the gospel. That's why he's sent there. Okay, he is exiled by the Roman emperor Domitian at that time. Now, notice it says had a voice like a trumpet. Now, that has several meanings in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they would blow a trumpet when they wanted the people to assemble. They would blow a trumpet, you know, to call them to war. They would blow a trumpet when they called them to march. You might remember Jericho. They were blowing trump trumpets when they were marching around the wall of Jericho. Now, in the signature passage of the rapture, you remember the trumpet call of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. You know, we see it there. And then when we get to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, when John is called up to heaven, which many believe is symbolic of the rapture as well, we see, you know, uh, he was called up with a voice like a trumpet. So trumpet, a lot of times, is very significant, and in this particular case, it's the voice of Jesus. So it's very important that you hang on to that notion about the trumpet. Now he says, write on a scroll what you see and send it to these seven churches. And if you look over there in verse 12, it says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were, like, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Now he's walking among, you know, he sees seven golden lampstands. Now, lampstands were bearers of light. Now, we'll talk about his here in a minute, but that's the churches. We're bearers of light. We're bearers of his light. We are not light ourselves, but we are bearers of his light. Okay? Now, you'll notice that he says to one or two of the churches in these letters, if you don't make the corrections that I'm telling you, then I'm going to snuff your life out, basically, your light out, okay? All right, now, son of man, he says that, you know, among them was the son of man. Well, that was Jesus' name for himself. As a matter of fact, you know, Jesus refers to himself as son of man 80 times in the gospel. But we also see Son of Man a very similar vision that Daniel had. If you go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, 
that took place 500, almost 600 from this date years earlier. It says, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Now, so in this case, what John and Daniel are saying, they're basically saying, I looked and I saw someone that looked like a human being. That's what he's saying. He looked like a human being. Now, what he's seeing is seeing the glorified Christ. Now, remember, the suffering servant, he died on the cross and was resurrected. He's not coming back again as the suffering servant. Okay, he is the resurrected Christ, and now he's the glorified Christ. That's what he's seeing. He's seeing Jesus in his glorified state. Now, notice the robe and the sash. That speaks to his role as high priest, especially the sash. Now, you know, kings would wear robes, granted, but that sash is a dead giveaway. He's talking about Jesus' role as high priest. He's our advocate. He intercedes for his people, okay? Now, then he says his hair is white. Basically, that speaks to maturity, purity, wisdom. And then this is the part that we should really, really pay attention to. He says his eyes were blazing like fire. Now, that means his eyes were penetrating. That means he's all-knowing. That means he searches our hearts. He searches our lives. That means he can't be fooled. Now, let me paint a picture for you. Jesus is walking amongst the lampstands, which are the seven churches, the seven lampstands, the bearers of light, and he has these all-knowing eyes blazing a fire. Now, think about that on Sunday morning. Now think about where your heart and your mind is when you come to worship the Lord. Think about you think about how ugly Mary Lou's shoes are. Well, Jesus knows that, right? Think about when you're saying, you know, I wish Bessie would, you know, do this or do that, you know, or whatever. Or, or uh, Steve Shore said a lousy illustration or whatever you might be thinking that's not related to worshiping God. Jesus is walking amongst the lampstands. He knows what we're thinking. He knows our hearts. He knows our lives. He knows where we are. Now, you might notice one of my favorite things to say when I pray and when I talk and you know, I do my sermons is help us get where we need to be. When I say help us get where we need to be, that's what I'm talking about. Get our hearts ready to worship, ready to receive his word, get where we need to be. Now, we're human beings, and you know that's what makes that wonderful word grace so special, especially as you go through the book of Revelation. I mean, the Lord loves us. He knows we're human beings. He knows we struggle to get where we need to be from time to time. But we should always be striving. But I will say this, knowing that Jesus is walking amongst the lampstands in his churches and all knowing when those penetrating eyes helps me to get where I need to be. How about y'all? Okay? All right. Now, if you look over there, it says, you know, his voice was rushing like rushing waters. It speaks to his authority. And then one that we should be very familiar with, you know, the double-edged sword, the Word of God. Now, if you look at Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, you know, that's pretty powerful. You know how the Lord, you know how the Word of God speaks to us. You know how the Word of God convicts us, okay? So, uh, and we'll find a lot of conviction throughout this study. It's just part of the deal. You know, speaking of which, you know, as believers, we shouldn't be afraid to be convicted. I mean, I, I tell you what, whatever progress the good Lord has helped me make, a lot of it has been, you know, by being convicted. You know, conviction is oft, oftentimes, when I talk about that chisel, God chiseling things out of your heart and chiseling things into your heart. A lot of times it's about the chiseling things out of your heart. I'm talking about conviction. You know, I picture the Holy Spirit, you know, chiseling these things out of my heart, which imagine it's painful. Somebody's applying a chisel to your heart. Well, conviction is painful, okay? Well, his greatest tool for conviction is, is the Word. You know, the Word speaks to you, and, you know, oftentimes along with the Holy Spirit, it, it convicts you. But don't consider that a bad thing. That's what gets you where you need to be. I will say this, and I've said this many times. If I were to haul off and pop Brad and cuss him out, you know, I should not be worried that I come under conviction. I should be somewhat comforted by that 
Because that means I belong to God. Okay, if nothing else. That means God saying, oh, you're my son, you belong to me, you're my child, and, my, and you don't behave that way in my family. Now, that's painful, but it's also reassuring because, you know, had now if I went off on Brad and popped him and cussed him out and didn't feel any remorse at all, then I would be in trouble. Would you all agree? Now, I'm going to try that on Friday. I'm going to come have a meeting with him. <laughs> All right. Now, the seven stars in his hands. We'll get to that here in a moment. And then it says his face was like shining light when he's the light of the world. We should all understand that. Now look at verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches, which we've already talked about. Now John falls down. He's scared to death. Now, remember who John is. John referred to him in his gospel as the disciple that Jesus loved. Okay? Love was all about, John was all about the love of Christ. He was the one that was at the cross. The rest of them didn't make it. They were afraid to go. or They scattered. But John was at the cross. John was also the one that Jesus gave the responsibility of taking care of Mary, his mother. So John was a pretty special guy to Jesus, yet he's scared. He's scared to death. Now, when you think about that, if John's scared, you know, what do you think we would do if we were in the presence of the Lord, right? Now, I, we hear a lot of stories. One of my favorite songs is I can only imagine, you know, what it would be like basically to be in your presence. I can't, I, you know, I know what I would do. I'd fall down just like John, okay? I, I, would I stand in your presence? I don't think I would. You know, and most of the time that is the normal reaction that you see when someone has a real true encounter with God. His holiness overwhelms them and they cannot get low enough and it doesn't matter who you are. Look at him. This is John, the disciple Jesus loved. Now, seven lampstands, seven churches. Lampstands display light, not the light himself. Now, he says the stars are angels. Now, some say that they're guardian angels. You know, that each church has a guardian angel assigned to them but most believe that he's speaking of pastors of the churches here. You know, basically that he has them in their hand because angels do not head up churches. Now, you know, one of the things that I think about that being a pastor, you know, is, is, you know, is comforting and it's also intimidating when you think about that. And that's one thing you need to remember is we're going to give an account. And when you see these letters to these churches that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing as we go forward, you know, there's a pastor that's being held accountable there, okay? So, you know, it does, it is an intimidating thought. It just goes with the territory, and I don't think a lot of people really understand it. I try to keep going forward and, 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 and lean on the Lord's grace, you know, as much as possible. Now, then he gives an effective, effectively an outline to the book. This is an outline of the book. He says, write down what you see. He's talking about chapter 1, what we've been covering. Write down what is now. He's talking about the condition of these churches, you know, which also represent the churches of all time, which we'll get into that. And then what must take place, which is the tribulation period from chapter 6, verse 9, chapter 19, when the church comes back with Jesus, when he comes back to establish his kingdom. Now, like I said, you know, sees our hearts. He sees our worship. Now, he sees our spiritual condition. Now, what are the attributes that you've seen here that really speak to you? That you see Jesus? Think about, speak, and just tell me what God's laying on your heart. Is that convicting? Is anybody in here that's ever come to, that comes to church every Sunday and you're exactly where you need to be? You're not distracted. You're not thinking about anything else. You're not thinking any negative thoughts. You're all about worshiping the Lord. You do that every Sunday. Raise your hand. I want to know who does that. Okay? But you know what? I don't think as human beings we can get there, but we could do a better job. Don't you think we can all do a better job? You know? 
And don't you think it's probably a good idea to prepare yourself sometime before you arrive at church and remember that you're getting ready to worship God, you know, when you get in there and this is God's house. I'll tell you a little story. I've told many of you before. Uh, years ago, 25 years ago, I was, uh, they were doing some sort of play or something with the kids, and, and uh, I was up there working with the sound and with two or three other people, and uh, there was three, li three little kids about Easton's age, I guess, and they were at their first pew, and they were part of the play. And I remember they were cutting up, and I, th I don't know, I'm going to say it was Keith or somebody, and they thought they'd have a little fun, and they put in their deepest voice, a, you boys better be good down there. And one of them, they could just froze, and then, you know, <laughs> and uh, one of them said, who was that? And the other one said, I think it was God. <laughs> but there's a story there. You see what I'm saying? I remember, you know, before the busyness of church and the busyness of being a pastor or serving even before I was a pastor got in there that I used to know that when I was in, you know, when I first started practicing my faith, that if I ever walked in a sanctuary and nobody was in there, I would just like, I'm in God's house. You know what I'm saying? I would get where I need to be. But we kind of have a tendency to let that slide, that attitude. That attitude's a good attitude. You know, that's a good attitude to have. But we kind of forget that attitude. Oh, I got to be at choir practice. Oh, Sunday school starts or blah, blah, blah. And it's great to greet each other. That's not where I'm going. It's great to be friendly. But when it's time to worship the Lord, we need to get our worship hat on. And we need to, you know, give him what he deserves. Okay? Anybody got anything else that you'd like to add about? We, verse 8, where it talks about, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is come. And he finishes that with the Almighty. And if you look in the Greek and all that, that means there's no contenders. Right. In other words, no, no rivals with God, but there is no contenders for his, his might. Right. It's, uh, it's powerful. You know, when, when you get started, um, basically, when the next two chapters are about these churches, and each one, two of them have nothing that disappoints Jesus. They don't get condemned at all. But the other ones have plenty, and a couple of them have no, no, nothing that he commends them for. And it tells you about, you know, the, the condition of these churches, and it speaks to the churches of the ages. And many people believe that America is best represented by the church of Laodicea, which is the lukewarm church that makes Jesus sick. That's another fault. And then when you get into chapter uh, uh, 4, uh, you don't hear the church anymore. And we'll point that out. The church is not mentioned. I think it's mentioned 22 times in the first three chapters. And then it's never mentioned again. So that gives more support for the rapture that we're gone, that we've been raptured, okay? We're not going to go through the tribulation period. And then you get in chapter 5 and 6, and, you know, we've already done those on Sunday mornings. You know, uh, that's basically the throne room and, and all the God's glory up there with the 24 elders and the lamb that was slain and you know, paint a picture. But then in chapter 6, that's when it's on. That's when the Antichrist rides out. And he's on that white horse, okay, which normally in the cowboy movies, the white horse is the good guy. Well, he's not a good guy. And then it's on, and then you see, you know, uh, the first seven seal judgments, and then you see a few parentheses, you see the 144,000, and then you see the trumpet judgment seven, and you see, eventually you see the seal judgments, and they just get worse and worse and worse and worse. And you see Satan, and you see a lot of really fascinating stuff going on. Uh, and then in chapter 19, Jesus comes back. And then, you know, things are much better for the rest of the book. So that's the outline of the book. And so uh, I would recommend that you read each chapter that we're going to talk about. We will shoot for a chapter each time. I don't know if we'll make it but uh, because we're not going to rush through it. But read up on chapter 2. And, uh, and I will say as you read the chapters of the churches... Uh, I hate to say this, but notice that he doesn't say, he says to, to this church and to this church and blah, blah. 
He, and he doesn't write an eighth letter to the folks that decided not to go to church. Did you notice that? You know, he, he said, and to you guys that don't go to church, let me write this. Now, that's not an option, you know, and I, I thought that's very important. You know, it's worrisome enough that these guys in these seven churches, you know, five of them are not pleasing him at all. Now, how much more worrisome would it be if you've chosen to be a Lone Ranger Christian and not be a part of the church? That would be very definitely something I wouldn't want to contemplate. Jesus doesn't even consider that. Okay? All right. Anybody got anything else? We'll go to the prayer list.